They know what we do, where we go, what we buy, what we surf for online, and how much we spend. They can recognize us from space and predict our action in stores. They are interwoven into our lives. They are surveillance technologies. Tonight, Big Brother is watching you, but what is he doing with all the information he's gathering? I'm Ernie Manous, and this is Houston 8. They watch us every day in everything we do, from red light cameras to grocery store scan cards. They know what we watch on our digital video recorders, who we talk to on our cell phones, and even where we go with our GPS navigation systems. Add to that the information we volunteer through social networking computer sites, such as Twitter and Facebook, and there's very little we buy, watch, or think that isn't being collected somewhere. Those who spearhead the technology say these advances are creating a better world where news, services, and products are readily available to those who specifically want and need them. But others fear we are in an Orwellian 1984 world where constant surveillance interferes with our personal rights and freedoms. Somebody is watching everything we do. But what are they doing with the information they are gathering? Joining us tonight are Rebecca Bernhardt, Policy Director, ACLU of Texas, Dr. Christopher Bronk, Baker Institute Fellow, Rice University, and Dr. Dennis Adams, Professor at the C.T. Bauer College of Business at the University of Houston. Welcome to all of you for being here. Thanks. I'm going to start off with a pretty broad question, and I will start with Dr. Adams. Should we be scared? You know, I think that, that technology runs so fast and our legal and social systems just have a hard time catching up. So there's a lot of reasons to be afraid, but the technology can also do a whole lot of good for us. So we, we've got the balancing act. Unfortunately, that balancing act changes all the time, mm -hmm. and somebody falls through the cracks. Dr. Bronk, same question. Should we be afraid? Uh, the technology is out there that can do a lot of interesting things, uh, but who are we afraid of? That's the real question. Are we afraid of industry? Are we afraid of government? Um, so when we, we lay out the fear question, you have to have a pretty uh, clear idea of what you want to be afraid of before you, you start measuring exactly how afraid you are. Okay, Rebecca, who should we be afraid of? Well, um, I think we need to, first of all, be balanced in terms of our fear, be reasonable. Uh, there are very real threats out there from a law enforcement perspective. Um, from a privacy and security perspective, there's also very real threats. I think a lot of folks feel if they're not doing anything wrong, they don't have anything to fear from a privacy perspective. Um, and that's really not true. Your medical privacy um, is a very sacred thing, even if you're not doing anything wrong wrong, letting that information go can have very real impacts on your family. Um, so I think folks need to be cautious and, and protect their own personal privacy and their family's privacy. And we really need to balance what are our, our security needs, our local and our national security needs, along with our personal privacy needs. Okay, I want to step back a little bit and talk, starting off with technology and talk about what is out there. Because uh, a lot of people would be surprised at the things that are traceable, and people would also be surprised at some of the things that aren't really happening. We seem to have these ideas of this 2001 world where everything is predicted and followed. Data recorders in cars, we have those. They can regulate speed. They can watch your speed and all of that. Talk a little about those. You know, there's, there's the number of computer chips in our cars are just, they're growing and growing. There's, there's hundreds of chips, and they're recording all kinds of things. They're, they're controlling the car, but they're also recording what, what happens in the car. So we could think of them as, as many uh, kind of the black boxes from, uh, from airplanes. Uh, what happens to that data, however, is most of the time it goes away. We don't, we don't really think about it. But but at what point do we start keeping that data and it starts ending up in the courts? It starts affecting the way our insurance policies are written. 
starts deciding, oh, you were in the wrong part of town. It might might uh, connect to, to a GPS sort of system. Explain also real quick to our audience out there what a GPS is. Some people might have heard the term but don't know what we're talking about. GPS is uh, it stands for Global Positioning Satellite, and it's, a, it's simply a way of tracking where you are within a certain range of, of uh, uh, kind of meters where your phone is or where the GPS tracking device is. So you can tell where you are or where you've been. And that's the thing about the data is, is we, we used to, we all grew up probably in a world where the data didn't have very long life, but now the data can live forever and ever, and it can be repurposed for something that it was, it was never meant to be collected for, and that's the scary part. Uh, in doing the research, I find out color laser printers actually have coding put on the back of them so that they can trace what printer it came from. Cell phones, of course, have GPS capabilities, surveillance cameras everywhere. Burned CDs, if you burn a CD on your computer, it can be traced back to you should you give it away. Christopher, what else are, is out there that we're not thinking about? Well, the, the, you, you see the supermarket key tags there. It, 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 look, there are two sides to this. Uh, your cell phone is a radio device. You can triangulate on it based on your proximity to different uh, antenna. Um, this can be used if you have an accident and you go off the road and no one knows where you are, which has happened. Uh, you can triangulate down to that location. Uh, there are plus sides to this. There's a lot of data being collected. We're on the internet. Every packet that goes out of our machine can be captured by someone somewhere. Uh, every email. Explain is packet so people know what okay, you mean. Okay, packet means the the building block of data transmission. So the little pieces that transmit the internet. Uh, basically, the way the internet works is, I decide to send you a message. Uh, the internet figures how to get it there, um, and if it has to route through one part of town or another because something's broken or doesn't work, the idea is the system is designed to fail effectively, i.e. that uh, when pieces break, uh, the packet still gets through. The message is received by you. Uh, so these, these massive stacks of data are floating around on fiber networks, and huge fiber optic cables that transmit at speeds approaching that of light in mm -hmm. massive volumes. There's just so much information being Okay, we went to our out. Facebook page, which is also tra traceable, but, and, and asked this question, and people kept writing back, you know what, I'm not important. Who would be watching what I'm doing? And then you talk about the amount of this data that's out there. To think that insignificant little me has anybody who cares what I do What's wrong with that school of thought? Well, um, one problem is that there is private information about uh, many of us on the Internet that can be used to steal your identity, create an alternative, non-legitimate version of you, and do economic uh, transactions in your name and, and mess up your credit, basically. There was an identity thief, I think he was in Florida, who went on the Internet and illegitimately got um, the names and driver's license numbers of a bunch of folks um, and stole money in their name, basically created credit cards and, um, and got credit in their name, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, now, that's not a legitimate use of that data, that the driver's license number data is not supposed to be that easily available that loophole has subsequently been closed. Um, but that's the problem with how easy it is to post information about folks on the Internet and then make it available. Interesting point. I don't want people to get confused out there listening to all of this, that it's just not information you volunteer. It's information other companies have put into pro reports that they have processed, and those are put up online without realizing, or they have shoddy security and so that. So even if you're diligent at your home and you don't want to put your personal information out there, it's still leaking. Somebody said with a Google search alone, you can find credit card info, expiration dates, phone numbers, name, address, social security number, PayPal IDs, eBay IDs and the passwords that go with them, credit card reports and expense reports, all just out there on every one of us. You know, the, the thing is, quite often we don't know what data we're giving away. We may use our, our uh, Kroger card to, uh, to get the discount on, on uh, you know, a 12-pack of, of Coke, but we're giving away data to a company fine company, but that, but what happens to that data after, after Kroger gets it or after Randall's gets it, we don't know. And that, that information may be paired up with uh, a company, let's, let's say there's a very popular Harvard uh, case study right now that pairs a, a health insurance company with a grocery store company. And they say, well, let's just look at the intersection between the insurance claims that, that people have and the 
food they buy at the grocery store. And let's see what we can learn about our customers, both the grocery store customer and the insurance company customer. Now, that's data that, that we are just giving away from the grocery store standpoint. And when we part participate in healthcare, we're giving that data away, but there are certain constraints we think are in place, but maybe not. See, I think a lot of people don't realize when you scan that little card at the grocery store, they are also watching, comparing, what products do you buy? If you buy this product, which was advertised here, and this other product was advertised there, did you buy both those products? And they're looking at exactly patterns right. and behaviors to build. In fact, uh, HEB, the, the, the store we, we here in Houston shop at a, a lot, actually redesigned their stores based around what you purchased together in your shopping basket. So they, they took that data and said, okay, how can we encourage people to buy more of product X? Well, let's put it in a place where they're likely buy the, their shopping patterns to do that. Okay, But you don't have to surrender your identity to do that. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gone in, forgotten the card, they give me a new one. Uh, we had a visitor this week, and he said, well, on my card, it's Joe Bag of Donuts of 555-1212-1211 uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, is my phone, and I'm at, my address is you know 1234 Mary Lane, and no one complains. So the companies can get a lot out of anonymized data. Right, as long as they know patient X does this and this, that's good enough for them. Exactly. Uh, so it, it's that negative repercussion piece where, you know, so that works, but how do you pay for your groceries? Mm -hmm. And I don't pay cash all the time for groceries, for, for sure. So then they tag your credit card to the... Now, Absolutely. the question is, has, has a supermarket chain you know, made those linkages? And what will those linkages cost? And I think the really you know, frightening thing for people is uh, the data aggregators, the companies that are actually in the business of putting this all together. Mm -hmm. So there's a company called ChoicePoint that, that uh, is used extensively for everything from employee background investigations to uh, histories for, for different kind of uh, evaluations. Um, and they were badly, badly uh, played by a Nigerian scammer um, who basically uh, was able to acquire more than a dozen choice point accounts with which to play with. I mean, and if you have a choice point account, you can get a lot of inf interesting information about people. You know, that's that public uh, or that private detective kind of level of guru status where you can understand things. When you're dealing with a choice point or an Axiom or a Verification Inc., these are all companies that do this, that gather information. Are they just taking information that you have signed off on? Are they, or are they investigating you? Can they take, let's say, your insurance claims where you filled out all your paperwork on that so they know who you are and all that? and then figure out what is your grocery store card. Are they free to do that legally, to tie together different pieces that aren't offered? The truth is that there are just very few protections for this information. I think in some situations, without knowing it, in certain uh, commercial transactions, we give up the rights to control data to have a credit card or to have certain commercial relationships. We just, without knowing it, maybe have agreed to give up certain information or to have a credit check done and then there's an agreement between the entity that's doing the check and uh, choice point that they get to keep that information afterwards. But for the most part, because these are all new or relatively new sort of realms, they the regulation is just 10, 20, 30 years behind the entities, and because they have become relatively powerful economic players, um, I think what's happened is they've been able to convince legislators and political leaders not to regulate them. So when problems have arisen, they've been able to say, trust us, we're doing the best we can, you really don't have to create a regulatory system to regulate us, we'll self-regulate, and everything will be okay, when in fact we can't trust them. Now, and please help me with this one. In 1974, there were limits placed on the government for gathering information about private citizens, right. but that didn't go to the private sector. So the business is still free to gather all this where the government has a restriction. There are truly very few limits on private sector collection but of data. But then the government can go and buy this information from the private sector that collects it and jumping around this. That's right. Yes, As a matter of fact, there are 
uh, police departments all over Texas that buy data from Choice Point um, frequently to enforce warrants. But the other thing about Choice Point and Axiom is that they don't have a real incentive to make sure that their data is perfectly accurate. So if you've ever gotten your credit report and you see there are 10 or 15 addresses on it, well, 10 of them are usually wrong, either a little wrong or a lot wrong. And so they use those addresses, uh, police departments do, to go enforce these felony warrants. That means they're going to potentially five or ten different houses that you don't or never lived at in an effort to enforce a warrant. And they're bugging people, sometimes guns blazing, to try to find the bad guy. Okay. But the other side of all of this is, you know what? They're looking for somebody who has done something wrong. So if someone's sure. got to come and knock at my door to find a criminal, and it's not me and I say, wrong house, and they go to the next one, they find the person. So it's an inconvenience. But the world is a safer place. The world is better. This technology has helped us grow. That's the other side of the argument. You know, the, the, there's no doubt that the technology has helped uh, the just the amount of, of junk mail you get in your physical mailbox has decreased over the last decade. We're getting less of that. And that's because those folks are getting smarter about saying, okay, well, Ernie only buys this sort of stuff. The, the, the downside is, however, there's, there's these massive database machines that, that cull through your information, and you don't know where the data came from. You don't know about the accuracy of the data. I have a, a great friend I went through uh, my MBA program with that went to work for one of these data an analytic firms. And she called me up uh, a, couple, a couple times a year, says, oh, hey, I see your neighbor got a new car. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I uh, said, so did you know that, that she's leasing the car? She doesn't. She didn't buy it. Oh, really? Uh, well, yeah, but you're still driving your old car. Yeah, I am. Uh, how are the kids? You know, yeah. let's, let's go on. So, uh, but, okay, so these all are kind of trivial, interesting, clever. You know, somebody works in a doctor's office, they can call you and tell you about somebody else that you know. But overall... Why is this a problem and should it be? Because now, yes, they're limiting the information that's given to me to just information I'm interested in. When I go to the grocery store, I know now I don't have to travel this huge expanse because what I want and what I'm going to buy have all been placed near each other because they've watched my pattern of behavior. They're saving me time. They're making my life safer. It's better if my car gets in a wreck that they'll be able to find me. Or if somebody hits me, they can check their data and see that they were going too fast for that area. What's the drawback in all of this, though? Well, I think the, the, the real problem is, so the regulatory environment is far, far behind. Um, we have a lot of waste, and, and you look at, uh, every time you click on a new uh, web presence uh, that you want to be a part of, there's a user agreement that you, you know, you're signing off on with a click. Uh, so we're entering into these contracts all the time. So when something does go wrong, where is I'm it I'm going to pause you right out? there real quick, just ask, um, Rebecca, are those agreements legally binding? just with a single click? You know, I can't give a legal opinion on all those agreements. I, you know, I have no idea. Okay, continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> just curious about that because I think when you say you just click it, I'm like, how right. binding can that actually be? It's a terms, yeah. uh, terms of use agreement. So you are entering into some sort of contract. And I'm not a lawyer, right. so I'm not going to. And they're, they're written <laughs> in some very interesting ways. Uh, but, but basically, we're, we're, we're at this point where when these things need to be sorted out, it, it ends up going to the courts. And it ends up being put in front of a judge, and you have a very technical set of arguments, and you have experts that are brought in to argue both sides of the problem. And really, I mean, this is a very inefficient way to getting to some sort of rule, rule set. Now, the, 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 the good news is, I mean, how long has the Internet been available to all of us? Fifteen years, basically. I mean, a million mm -hmm. computers on the Internet, early, early mid-1990s. So, and this is a sea change in the entire organization of... The, the transmission, dissemination, sharing, creation of, of all information that's going on right now. We are at a, you know, this is the, public, uh, the printing press moment in history for us. So these things aren't going to be sorted out uh, by, by bureaucrats and by, by legislators in a, 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 a uh, succinct, timely fashion. Uh, everything's changing much too quickly. Mm -hmm. So then what, what is going to do it? Where are the laws going to come from? As we've said already, you know, we're dealing with privacy laws that are 20 years old for things that, it, I mean, in public, what was the comment? In public, no expectation of privacy. That was the old say, the old belief. Is that going to remain the same? What is public? What is private anymore? Well, well I was going to say, I think that, I think, you know, our experience has been 
that when extremely bad things happen, we get legislative reactions. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's probably what's going to happen here. And there are some countries that are far ahead of us on this. Great Britain has uh, this incredible network of closed circuit TV Hold surveillance. Hold right there. One of our viewers writes, I know you're supposed to get over the fact that privacy is dead. I haven't, however, won't go to London anymore because of CCTV, <laughs> right. which is these closed circuit television. And you're you, and you about. asked sort of what's the negative outcome. I mean, there was, you know, an entirely law abiding citizen in Britain who who was pulled over and arrested under their anti-terrorism laws because of uh, something that was seen on a surveillance camera. His, you know, sort of license plate was tracked, and it was determined that he was suspicious for some reason, and, and you know, full felony arrest as a result of sort of the tracking of his license plate, and he was not engaged in any sort of suspicious activity. Um, um, a mother who, I can't remember, it had to do with something about her daughter. She was trying to get her daughter transferred to a different school. They thought that she didn't act actually live in that district. And so the, the school started to engage in surveillance of this family to find out if they were in the right neighborhood. They used the like anti-terrorism laws to surveil the family um, and like and tracked this this family, their vehicle with the cameras, you know, for weeks just to enforce the local law about which school your kid attended. So these are the kinds of misuses that can re resolve when you have you know, petty bureaucrats use the laws and the surveillance system that's in place for the wrong things. Well, I want to talk also, and I don't mean to cut anyone off there, but about surveillance cameras. Sure. And when you talk about their behavior, and then there is programs, I'm trying to find, uh, Varent Systems does a program that mm. calculates what your behavior is to understand what you will do next. <laughs> and they do that through right. the camera. So if you're in a store and you pick up a certain number of products without putting any in your cart, now they are going to target you and watch you more direct. Right. This is really getting kind of scary in some ways. I, I think that, uh, that the notion that we grew up with about privacy, I'm going to go in my bedroom and shut the door sort of thing, has, is, is really evaporating. We, we live so much of our lives online, whether it's what we watch on the Internet, what we watch on television, where we drive. So we're going to have to, in, in succeeding generation, generations, think differently about uh, be, uh, our private life. My, uh, my father, twice a week, would, would announce at 10 p.m. every night, or twice, twice a week, week. Uh, he was getting up and going go to go to no delay, the store. And he, my dad, for 30 minutes, would go off the grid and just go, you know, he'd go sit and talk to the guy at the store. Well, going off the grid now is, is an extremely intentional act. We have, to th we have to really think about, okay, I want to go off the grid. And the, our laws are, are way behind on, on what that means. It, it, it generates suspicious tags all right, over I'm the place. Right, I'm going to assume if you don't want to be tracked, suddenly right. you're up to something bad. So you're presumed guilty right. yeah. of doing something just because you want to be like my dad and have Go a little in. private time. Yeah. And I think we need to talk about this profiling phenomenon because it pops up in a bunch of different places. This variance is, is one sort of example. In a much more innocent version, we're headed... Um, in immigration reform potentially because uh, Senator Schumer wants to have a biometric identifier, probably a fingerprint, and e-verify be part of immigration reform, which would basically require every American to have um, their identity verified with a fingerprint to get a job. Um, and what that means, because we already have this in a smaller federal program right now, is that for people who are born with fingerprints that don't show up as well as other folks, they just don't have quite as obvious ridges, they could become unemployable. Um, because the systems don't pick up their fingerprints very well. Right, but the technology well. is moving, as we've said earlier, so now there's the eye scans, there's the textures well, so of the skin. Yeah, but so for five be... or ten years, you're not going to be able to get a job until they work out the kinks. That's not Chris really Trump, great for folks. Chris, I'm going to toss this folks. to you. Yeah, so uh, 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 Homeland Security has wanted a uh, biometric uh, facial scan because that's the least intrusive. Nobody knows if your face is being scanned. I mean, if there's a camera somewhere and it picks it up and, and can match it, we know when we give a fingerprint. And I've given all 10 to the federal government uh, for terms of employment. And this is something you do, you surrender uh, uh, you know, for certain uh, obligations or responsibilities. We expect everyone, everyone who comes to this country to give up fingerprints now. So if you want a visa to come to the United States, you're putting one of these on a scanner. Uh, so the technology is 
maturing. Technologies all over the place are maturing, but there are big problems. If you're uh, you know, collecting a biometric, and I've been on the other side, of, you know, I've been the bureaucrat collecting the biometric. If you're 75 years old and you've been working in the field someplace, it's probably not going to capture very easily. Mm-hmm. So, and you know, so facial recognition is it getting better gradually over time? But when I went to ask a, a, a mathematical symmetry expert about this a few years ago, she said she was very encouraging. She said, "Oh, things are really improving. We're up to about 70 percent on most cases." Now, 70% is good for sci- the lab, for scientific right. research. Um, but when we talk about something that's going to be doing national security at airports or uh, something that we're going to base our whole society on, we want one of those kind of Six Sigma kind of figures, 99 with a bunch of nines behind it, because mm-hmm. when it's wrong, the consequences are so grave. And I'm going to come back to you, Dennis, before we run out of time, because they're giving me final thoughts. You know, uh, as somebody who works in the the College of Business, we we try to find kind of business ways of using this thing, uh, and and we do it all the time. Whether it's it's RFID chips that we didn't really talk too much about, or global positioning, uh, we we want to find a way to sell you things where you are. And, and we want to find a way to be able to take care of ourselves, so we're going to have to run out of time right now. Right. I thank you all for coming. I'm sorry we've run out of time. Remember, now each week we invite you to visit our home online at Houston PBS. Simply click on the local program bar, pick Houston 8, and then you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topics, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions that we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week.